Hello, and welcome to Vox Imperia, the Oculus Imperia podcast. I have one of these now. It's new, because I, like any content creator with opinions and friends, have to have a podcast by some sort of legal mandate. This is a fun little experiment. This is exploring ideas and fun aspects about the lore and the universe or the hobby that I can't do in the character of our dear Oculus. So uh, thank you for joining me whenever this will happen. Uh, probably going to be pretty infrequent. I don't want it to get in the way of the regular channel, but I expect this to be fun and I hope you'll join me for the little exploration of Warhammer 40k and how to get into it. That's the plan for today. Um, for it, I am joined by two very dear friends and patrons and comrades in the eternal class struggle and educators extraordinaire, Das and Sal. Say hi, guys. What's going on, everybody? Hello. So, what with Space Marine 2 being a thing... I don't know if anyone's heard about this little video game that's kind of making a big splash. Um, I've had questions about how to get into Warhammer 40,000, 40k, from a very beginner perspective. Everyone has a lot of opinions about this, but it would be helpful to have something of a primer. Uh, as someone who's kind of been around the lore and the hobby for quite some time, and a possessor of opinions, I thought it would be a good idea to get some friends together and kind of have a bit of a chat about how we think that should be done, if it works for you. So, without further ado, I guess what is Warhammer 40,000? At a fundamental level, and I think if you've listened to the channel you might have had some sort of grasp of this, Warhammer 40,000 is a tabletop miniature war game, uh, in a science fiction future, where the characters of that science fiction future exist as miniatures that you can play games with, or you can paint. But it is also a vast and expansive science fiction universe, where those characters live, fight, die, do all sorts of wonderful, terrible, horrible, horrible things. Because at its core, and I think the reason we all love it, this future is dark as hell. I think I got that one pretty right, guys. Anything to add? Pretty solid. I mean, do you like do this for a living or something? Or it's, uh, I don't know. Something know. like that. <laughs> yeah, Maybe I, I should. don't think there's anything else to really add other than it's dark as hell and goofy as hell, almost in equal measures. Sometimes the goofiness as a result of the darkness, too. That is exactly spot on. Warhammer does have its roots in the kind of absurd science fiction satires that blew out of Britain in the 1980s. Not that America was not doing excellent science fiction satire in the late 80s. There were some really good movies in that genre. But at its core, it is not serious. And at the same time, super serious. And because it's super serious, it is not serious. Uh, it is ludicrous. It is over the top. It is insane. It is churches flying through space and that's kind of why we love it how did you guys first get into warhammer because everyone approaches it in a completely different way i found throughout my time even just connecting with other hobbyists and lore enthusiasts through the channel that no one's story is quite the same so does give us give us your story sure um and i think it's that kind of going off what you just said that it's really important to, I think, stress that there is no wrong way to get into this stuff. Like, I think 40K is really interesting in that it has so many different, like, vectors that can get you into it. Whether it's, like, you know, the tabletop, reading books, playing video games, spending your time rifling through wikis or, God help you, listening to lore YouTubers. Um, 
But what got me into it, interestingly enough, was I picked up just on a whim back in, I don't know, Dark Ages of 2004, the original Dawn of War RTS game. Um, nice. I had no experience with 40K outside of, you know, I'd walked into hobby shops and seen, you know, miniature boxes on the wall and stuff like that. But, you know, as someone who spent a lot of his childhood early teen games playing rts games like starcraft and such this seemed like a game to s- scratch the itch um yeah we it's play- a solid solid call yeah Definitely exactly a good pick yeah um and then going through it i mean struck by what is this setting and i'm sure anyone who's played that game probably remembers that like insanely wild opening cutscene with space marines fighting orcs in this blown out industrial hellscape and just thinking Okay, this is really cool. Uh, that, that opening was a profound thing for me because I'd been into 40K for years at that point, and that was the first time I'd ever seen anything, like, animated. It's like, so I've cool. heard the first time they'd been anything other than static art pieces. And until and probably about three or four years ago, it was still some of the only high-quality 40K animation that we had that was official. Yeah, so was I remember wild. every, like, year or two... I'd go back and just binge watch all of the Dawn of War cinematics because it was the only way to get my fix. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I watched it actually recently. Um, I think just based off of just you know, you know, playing Space Marine and all that stuff, just kind of thinking, yo, does this thing still hold up? Oh, it does. It it still bangs. Yeah, still holds up. Um, still solid. And then you know, obviously after finishing playing this game for a while, I'm like, well, I I need to learn more about this. Uh, and then I kind of forgot about it until I got to college and then started falling down all of these various like wiki pipelines of whether it's, I think, I think it was like the early days of Lexicanum, which is just kind of the old school, like Warhammer lore wiki. And I remember sitting in like my college lounges on one of the school computers, just pouring over lore pages just in my downtime being like, okay, this is so freaking cool. Um, and really it isn't until only, only kind of a couple of years ago where I kind of graduated from just engaging with, you know, lore wikis and the occasional video game to actually sitting down and like getting into a lot of the novels, um, which I obviously we're going to talk about a little later, but, uh, yeah, like I, I know in comparison to both of you and I know a lot of people like, yeah, I have never painted a miniature. I have never played a round of the tabletop. Uh, yeah, this is just something that I just played a, a really cool video game that made me think, yo, this is really cool. I want to I wanna learn more about what this is. And here we are, 15-ish years later. God, we're getting old. <laughs> don't don't f-ing remind me. <laughs> uh, Sal, why don't you give us your tale? Yeah, I actually probably started about the same time as DOS, but through a very different way. So I was in, the young one here, I was in fifth grade, and one of my buddies was showing me his, these sick little Lord of the Rings figures. Hell yeah. (laughs) Shout out to the Lord of the Rings game, still the best game GW has ever made. Um, It is fantastic, (laughs) and that's what got me into this whole miniatures thing that I have not been able to escape from for the last 15 years of my life. So I got into the Lord of the Rings game that led me towards like, oh, what's that other guy you've got over there? Yeah, the one with the chainsaw for a sword. And as it does for, I think, any uh, tween age guy, uh, a chainsaw sword is the coolest thing you can possibly have. Quite and correct. so I had to really? play Warhammer. Yeah. So that's how I got into it. Just gradually, a bunch of my friends got into it too around the same time. And so we were hanging out after, you know, middle school, painting our Warhammer miniatures and then fighting with them and stuff like that. And then here I am 15 years later. I have a closet dedicated to my Warhammer models and a bookshelf just for them. And I can't escape it if I tried. I, 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 I think you've threatened to, like, mail me entire armies several times over the years. I, I need them gone. No. <laughs> Stop. Ah, uh, the I'm, hobbyist I'm, I'm ha- experience. I'm happy where I'm at. I don't, I don't need that. <laughs> Until you do. Jesus. What I love about this is that, like, we have already two... I'm not going to say polar opposites, but, like, 
I've always described interest and engagement with Warhammer as existing on essentially like this triangle where one point of it is painting, one point of it is gaming, and one point of it is lore. And everyone finds themselves at some point on, inside the triangle. Like, you could be someone who is an avid painter and gamer and know next to nothing about the lore. You could. You could be someone who is all about the lore and doesn't even want to touch a hob doesn't want to touch a model to save their lives. That's me. You could be someone who just wants to paint and doesn't care about the game and just wants to, you know, capture some cool models and paint them up when it's dark and cold outside in the Canadian winter. <laughs> um <laughs> But for me, my intro was kind of a little bit halfway between you two. Um, I got handed in my f first year of middle school, which I believe is the, the, the Irish equivalent of first year of secondary school. I got handed a issue of White Dwarf. And in amidst the pictures of really cool looking models with, as Sal says, chainsaws for swords there was an article uh called index astartes and it was written by an incredible gentleman called phil kelly and it was about a space marine chapter called the night lords and my 12 year old brain could not handle the sheer gothic insanity of that particular article um it's a phenomenal like i mean i think it still holds up to this day truly even with all of the lore that has been built up around this particular legion um it still holds up in that it is phenomenally evocative of a horrible future where horrible things happen and everyone is unhappy <laughs> and it's metal as hell <laughs> So I must have read that thing a dozen times all while listening to like an audio slave album in the background um, because it was the early 2000s. And from there, it all just spun out. I went to a local like toy shop that happened to have hobby, hobby stuff. I saw a box set on the wall that was uh, Dark Eldar 3.5 edition. I bought that because like these guys are covered in knives <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> uh, and then I painted them up and turns out some guys that I was friends with had models and we fought them and I lost a whole bunch of times because it's Dark Eldar. No one would ever start the game as a teenager playing an army like Dark Eldar. So I immediately went and got Space Marines and it's been that, that way ever since. I have been <laughs> into the hobby, into the lore, immersed in the whole gamut of it. Into two different points among the those three varying poles at different times in my life um then yeah then god it's been over like has it been 20 years we, we don't we don't need to say periods of years or time anyway i think i think we've gone deep enough there well it's been over two decades <laughs> um also can i just say it's amazing that i feel like all three of us described our experiences of getting into 40k the way the way you'd imagine someone describes developing a crippling drug addiction well, I mean, exactly. In a good way. In a, in a good way. In a good way. Like, it's just damaging to your wallet, very, not your health. Very good. It's very good. <laughs> um, I I want to say that Index of Studies Night Lloyd's article, it's so sick. It's so mm, sick. That intro paragraph, the Night Lloyd's have always belonged to the darkness. <laughs> Ever since their inception, the black seed of their Primarch infected them with violence and despair. Like, you can't read that and knock it into this. No, you can't. And, like... I'm gonna go back and check this out. You have to. It's It still holds up. It's still good. It's still everything I think that Warhammer is lurid gothic insanity distilled into just something that is, as you say, Sal, totally sick. And I think that just epitomizes the whole thing. Like, it's just something that, you know activates that part of your brain that's just like oh damn that's cool as hell it makes it doesn't have to make sense it doesn't have to be even necessarily super coherent you just look at it and it's just like damn that's cool as hell yeah and then you go through the same article and it's talking about how terrible and horrible their lives are and then there are these guys with 
big uh, pogging mouths and bat wings going out of their heads. And you're like, oh, okay. I see where we're going with this. Yeah, it's like, yeah, this tracks. <laughs> so those are our intros, varying as they are. And from them, we have all built upon uh, our love of this particular universe and filled in the gaps and discovered new things and met with other people who like them. And that's the journey I kind of want for everyone with this, to just find your find your vector, find what you like, find things that you see and are just like, ah, it's, that's, that's cool as hell. It's cool as hell. I want to do that. Um so I thought that we could get together and I thought that we could chat about options. What we think are good paths into the lore specifically. We'll talk about the lore. This is not a hobby podcast as it stands. Um, but ways in which you can engage with the universe and you can fill out all those questions that you have. Because one of the things that I loved about the Space Marine 2 release week is that people who had never really played Warhammer or never played a game as, let's face it, as very richly realized as Space Marine 2 is, um, were encountering things and, like, I saw on Twitter a whole lot. Oh, so just good, man. So the good. Epitome, the epitome is one where, uh, I, I can't remember the name of the, the, uh, the individual who tweeted it, but I remember. Oh, it was the Paul Tassi tweet, right? With, with the yeah. Cyber Cherub? Yeah. The Thank you. Tweet. The exact so one where... Someone encountered a uh, cherub, essentially. <laughs> He's like, For what the hell am I looking at? I'm like, welcome to 40K, Paul. <laughs> yeah, and it, it is one of those things where we as we as people who have been in this for the longest time will see that and just be like, oh, you mean, yeah, the cyber cherub? Yeah, you know, it's, what do you expect? It's a starship. Of course it has a creepy cybernetic cherub child flying around doing something. Um, and other tweets therein being just like, what's the deal with all these candles in this room? Is it someone's job to just go and light all the candles every day? And again, as Warhammer fans, you're kind of like, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty that's much. the candle menial. Yeah. Yeah, he comes yeah. from a long line of candle that's, menials. That's, that's his job on the ship. Yeah. It's a generational thing. He, he yeah. like his, every individual in his family line before him have been lighting candles for thousands of years. That's how it works. It's a very honorable position. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, Esteemed, yeah, even. That, that was one of the best weeks on Twitter in a long time, just watching all of these people who are, understandably, like, having a great time with Space Marine 2, just posting all of their reactions to all of the insanity in the game. Because, like you said, uh, we, we have absolutely not gotten any kind of 40K video game, of which there have been many over the years that realizes the setting with that degree of vividness and attention to detail. Like you you can tell the folks who made that game like are a huge 40k nerds and they like they wanted to get all of it. And man, wa watching just so many people just see the most or some of the more just batty parts of the setting and just be like what the hell am I looking at? Oh, it's so much fun. <laughs> and that's totally why we wanted to get together today because again, we as jaded long fangs in the whole in the continuum of things don't even necessarily register the room full of candles yeah <laughs> and i hope that you will bear with us as we pontificate about ways in which we think that you as someone who you know is curious has played the video game has maybe read a book or two might want to get in to the hobby to the lore um I always find, at least personally, that the most foundational ways that you can explore the lore, to get a real good grasp of the setting, to figure out that this is the 41st millennium, it is the imperium of man that has existed for 10,000 years, 10,000 years with the golden throne sustaining the life of the god emperor, an empire built in his name that is the worst, most horrible regime imaginable. Billions upon billions upon billions of humanity heaving, desperate for survival, protected by genetically engineered superhumans and inexhaustible armies fighting against aliens and extra dimensional horrors every day. It's all horrible. It's a minute to midnight. 
It's perpetually a minute to midnight. It's never getting better. There's no hope. Welcome to Warhammer. My personal way in would always be start with the core rulebook. In the same way that if you're getting into Dungeons and Dragons or that sort of lore, maybe engaging with what the company who publishes all of this stuff considers to be the way in is a good idea. <laughs> I know for myself that when I started out, I got the third edition rulebook and I poured over that thing for months, reading and rereading it. They're not deep necessarily, but they are phenomenally comprehensive foundational texts. And I'd like to get your guys' opinions on that because I don't know if Das has read a rule book in his life. I, but I have imagine Sal never has. so much as cracked a rule book before. So maybe don't start with me. <laughs> and there we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, the rule books, I'm going to second what Oculus says here. Definitely the best place to start for just a broad overview of the world, the setting, the different factions, etc. Even as Oculus like really w nicely paraphrased, that very opening text that at the beginning of every rule book puts you into the setting more than anything else can, really. It is the 41st millennium, everything sucks, have fun. Yep. Um, and this, if you just read through the rule book, skip the rules if you don't care about playing the game, you should care about playing the game, <laughs> um, <laughs> is... Just read the little lore blurbs. Read the tiny little stories that they weave in there. It's all of the stuff that you need to know to really get it. And then from there you can expand out, like, let's say the Dark Eldar catch your fancy because it's a bunch of twiggy elves covered in knives. Pick up the Dark Eldar Codex next, and that'll lead you through every basic thing you need to know about that faction. I really just think, like, GW knew what they were doing, and put the important stuff in the books that you need to play the game right there for you. I agree. And this is, if you super want to engage with something that's considered like official, the most up-to-date version of the setting, the present rule book is, to my mind, always the best place to start. It is, you know, it's not going to be comprehensive. It's not for everyone to pick up a giant hardback. I recognize that these things are often quite expensive. That being said, older edition rulebooks often still hold up and can usually be picked up at a hobby shop for quite cheap. I remember seeing even just at my local one, you can get copies of the third edition rulebook for like five or ten bucks. And those are still great books because one of the great aspects about 40k lore is that even as it goes on, it is being updated Older stuff is never necessarily invalid. Uh, the universe has changed substantially since 3rd edition, when I started. We're now on 10th edition, for clarification. But that doesn't mean that the 3rd edition rulebook is a bad document. If anything, it still forms a wonderfully foundational piece of world building and mood building. The core tenets of everything that is in that are still accurate, for the most part. Touch wood, someone in the comments is going to fight me on this. <laughs> that Don't being worry, I just reread it. You're, pretty, you're in the clear. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, the elephant in the room here, obviously, uh, is the concept of the wiki. Or r slash 40k lore on Reddit. Or YouTubers who talk about lore. Ew. 1d4chan, lexicanum, etc, etc. All of these are also extremely valid. No one would, well, I mean, hope. I hope no one would consider gatekeeping lore behind official publications only. That being said, online sources, fan discourse, all of that is open to interpretation. All of that is open to personal flavors, personal opinions, and human fallibility. They are just as valid as everything else. But I think what I'm trying to get at here is that this is all a continuum. No one is going to read one book, one source, and come away with a fully comprehensive understanding of 40k lore. It's less of like a thing to be conquered and more of a vibe. 
<laughs> if <laughs> if uh, if that theory can hold up. I definitely agree. Yeah, I'll, I'll sign 40K on to that too. is mostly a vibe. And, um, like, starting with the wiki, starting with fan discussions, it's awesome. It's great. Anything that gets you into this wonderful universe is going to make your life better, even if you come out of it sounding like a drug addict. Um, but it is also kind of like getting into Game of Thrones by reading a bunch of, like, slash fix. And that's not a bad thing. If that gets you into something awesome, awesome. Mm -hmm. You just also want to make sure you expand beyond that and you're not talking about your uh, Tywin rare pair as if it's canon. <laughs> I mean, you can if you want. Uh, <laughs> true. We're not, we're, 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 we're not policing here. If there was you, ever you, a reference that truth. I did not expect to get on the first episode of my podcast, I'd say it would be that one. Um, <laughs> I mean, but, you, I don't know what you were thinking inviting the two of us on. but Yeah, ex God, exactly, exactly, exactly. But I digress. <laughs> this is the wonderful thing about fandom and the thing that I always want to bring to any discussion about Warhammer when anyone, whenever anyone asks me about it is that you're here to enjoy yourself. Everyone is here to enjoy themselves everyone's experience of it is going to be personal and idiosyncratic. And that's kind of beautiful. We're all just here to enjoy this sick as hell fictional <laughs> science fiction universe. Um, but while fan discussions, while wikis, while lore videos are all cool, they are ultimately fan reflections on work that authors, that game developers are doing. And work that is phenomenally compelling creative output. And I am always going to say, engage with the text if you can, because that is where you're going to find, I don't know if purest is the right word, maybe most compelling, maybe most fully realized is a better way of talking about it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's just speaking from my own experience, because again, for the longest time, my engagement with the setting was almost exclusively via wikis and YouTube comment and, and yeah, and like YouTube creators. Um, and for whatever reason, I just kind of never moved past that for a long, or I didn't move past that for a long time. But then when I finally did make the jump, I think it was, um, yeah, I was traveling back from the West coast and I had a long flight with multiple connections and um, I got the Betrayer audiobook off of Audible. That was the first one. Oh, Ooh. that's a good one. And that's a good it's, one it's a good one, with. and you're already breaking one of the rules. I know. Into later, I know. But... Yeah, don't go, go to this book. I mean, bear in mind, I, I had already been inculcated into yeah, all oh, the yeah, lore yeah. for a very long time. Um, but, yeah, that I finally made the decision to go jump into a book. And, like, my audio, my audi my Audible library is like 80 percent 40k at this nice. point <laughs> like my audio my audible library is entirely 40k with the exception of 10 free books i got by for joining free that were like hi here's 10 canadian authors hashtag cancon but no your, your, your point about like there 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 really is such a palpable difference and this is not to take away from all of the really incredible fan creators out there whether they're lore tubers God, or no. they are doing custom animations any of that stuff it's so good but when you like the the caliber of people and especially the caliber of writers that the 40k universe especially more recently has assembled and that games workshop has put to work fleshing this setting out is really remarkable like as far as it the, is. the quality of books and of narratives that are being produced largely again in the form of the various novels but you can find them in all various other contexts too but like you're you're doing yourself a disservice if you never really like get into the work that those guys are producing cuz they're it's amazing exactly and something that has always been stressed or at least has largely been stressed Warhammer is not a plot, it is a setting. Mm. And within that setting, there are plot threads. And maybe in recent years, there has been more of a trend towards a more grand universal plot thread, somewhat akin to, say, a certain cinematic universe. But at the same <laughs> time, not. It remains at its best a sandbox 
wherein characters, plots, concepts can just smash off each other and produce incredible results. Um, and I think without further ado, we are going to recommend to you the hopeful new listener who new listener, new fan, new Warhammer enthusiast who has not turned off this podcast a half an hour in in disgust because we have not shut up about how much we love this stuff. Um, we want to recommend to you uh, a series of prose novels that we consider to be foundational and also just excellent fun times through which you can really flesh out your understanding of the setting, your understanding of the possibilities of the setting, and provide you sort of a launch pad from where you can go off and explore to your heart's content. Because trust me, you will, there are depths that, <laughs> there are depths that you don't even, you can't even comprehend. You start with, Oh, so the guns fire explosive rounds. And then within a little while, you're just like exploring about, I don't know, the silent ones or who the outsider was or what is going on in the ghoul stars. And next episode, we're doing a 40k iceberg. <laughs> Seriously, right? Oh, yes. You think you oh. think this episode is unhinged? Oh my god, that one's gonna be uh, absolutely a forty k iceberg one will have to be done. Louise is gonna kill me for stealing her, <laughs> her concept. Shout out to Rogue Hobbies, we love you. Um, so yeah, we're gonna start with Space Marines because it's Warhammer forty thousand. You've just played Space Marine two, or you've seen an image of a space marine and you're wondering what the hell that is i think we had we had a little bit of a chat about book options before going in and i pitched this one and it was met with resounding i think approval my recommendation for the space marine book to read if you are choosing any of them is spear of the emperor by aaron dembski bowden um it is to my mind the kind of quintessential space marine novel it's fundamentally self-contained it is modern it takes place in the setting that is as up to date as you can get and at least to my mind cuts to the core of one what makes space marines cool and badass as hell and also what makes them tragic horrible and completely unaspirational <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty good are you saying you don't want to grow up to be a genetic monstrosity bred to only to kill? I'm saying that. I'm saying oh. hot, hot take. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I guess I'm the odd one out. Yeah. And, and it's funny because I know for, for like the past week or so, we've all kind of been brainstorming, you know, books books to talk about. Uh, just just quick aside, um, I'm pretty sure every book we're going to talk about is also available in audio format. So like if you're like me, who's a big audio book person, um, I believe everything we're going to recommend you can get in audio form. So that's just a quick aside, but and all pretty high quality audio. Yeah, audio. absolutely. I love the yes. audio yeah, books. like they they don't skimp on the narration for the most part. Like almost every forty k book is going to have some pretty banging narration. Uh, but yeah, it is, and as soon as you mentioned this book, I think it it's a perfect choice for all the reasons that you mentioned. Um, you're probably going to notice that this the author of this book, Aaron Dembski Bowden, his work we're going to recommend in other capacities as well. Um, he's someone who has been writing books in the setting for quite a while now, right? I mean, probably yeah. Go, yeah. going on, what, 15 years or so? And he, at least in my mind, almost kind of revolutionized the kind of character building that we see in the setting, which is not to say that before him there was there were no good characters. There absolutely were, but his books and this book um, in particular, um, they I have a way of adding incredibly grounded human complexity to every character in his stories. And when you're dealing with a setting like 40K, which is so ridiculous, which is so just completely off the walls. Being able to have multi-dimensional 
very believable and grounded characters is something that's not easy to do. And he somehow manages to do it in every single book he writes. I don't know how. Um, but yeah, like I, I, it took me a while to get to this book and it's so good. It's, it's so, so good. good. The rough outline, and we're only going to give rough outlines of these because we want you to experience them to the fullest if you can. The rough outline of Spear of the Emperor is a space marine from a chapter called the Mentor Legion is attempting to find safe harbor with space marines of another chapter called the Spears of the Emperor, who have been a bit out of contact with the Imperium because the Imperium is big and there's always a catastrophe. And right now there's an even bigger catastrophe than there's ever been going on. And everyone's just trying to make it work. So it, it's as much as it is about a genetically engineered superhuman attempting to find and train and bring into Imperial alignment other genetically terrifying superhumans. It is also about a dude trying to do a job with his co-workers, who he also owns, and uh, all of the adventures, let's call them that, that happened along the way. Um, I'm gonna, I'm seconding what Das has said about character work. Uh, Aaron is utterly, un, almost unparalleled in his ability to just evoke the humanity in what is a future that by its definition, robs everyone of their humanity under the crushing weight of oppressive systems. What he also is able to do is... Space Marines often have a bit of a problem as being presented as heroes when... I mean, by the Imperium standards, they are in the same way that, like... Frederick Zoller in Inglorious Bastards is a hero of the regime that he is a part of. This is the worst, most awful authoritarian regime imaginable. Its heroes are not good people. There are no good guys in this setting. That needs to be understood. Often, that can kind of get lost in the wash a little bit, especially with the term heroes being thrown around. The Spears of the Emperor are not looked upon as heroes by the people of the world that they are based on. And that is something that shouldn't be surprising necessarily in Warhammer fiction, but is. And its inclusion in this book is why I would always recommend it as like people's first stop to get a grasp of what it is to be a space marine in 40k. Because there are enough human characters around to provide a good frame of reference about how completely detached and inhuman the space marine is as a concept. And also gives you enough action scenes for them to be sick as hell. Oh yeah, yeah. We really can't say enough enough good about that book, and especially more recently with the current iteration of the setting. And there's a, for those of you who played Space Marine Two, there are some mentions of it. Like there's a lot going on, kind of at that macro level story. And Spears of the Emperor again. If you know the beats of that macro level story, like if you, you know, know the overall kind of state of the galaxy, there will be stuff for you to pick up on. You'll be like, oh, well, that makes sense. You know, those of you who were played through Space Marine 2 and see, you know, hearing about Primaris Marines, you'll be like, okay, this, this is tracking. But if you don't, the story is still great. You're not going to bounce off it um, in ways that there are definitely other... Uh, Space Marine oriented books where you very likely would bounce off it if you don't, you know, or are at least more well versed in some of the more minor or like minutia of at least the current setting. It will actually give you a good primer on yeah. Primaris Marines. Yeah, so seriously. Um, and yeah, seconding about how you don't really bounce off it, I think that's another one of ADB and Dembski Bowden's strengths is that because he likes to use these grounded viewpoint characters and this wonderful character work, even if you have no idea what Warhammer is, and even if you don't really care about the setting yet, this is a good place to start because you care about the characters and they care about the setting. Exactly. And it kind of transfers yeah. that way. Exactly. Absolutely. You get a grasp of what it means to be both a space marine and a regular human in as much as the regular humans in the story can be typified as such. And that is compelling. It's deeply compelling. Um, as I think a bit of an aside to this, um, 
the company Games Workshop is currently publishing a series called uh, Dawn of Fire, um, which has kind of been running a bit concurrently with the new editions. It's a bunch of self-contained novels with something of an overarching plot beat um, that is very much designed to be your prose intro to 40k. Um, I think it's a very robust series. I think it's certainly an excellent starting point. I wouldn't have necessarily enjoyed it as much as I have the rest of these books. That is not to say it's bad by any means, because I'm someone who's been in 40k for 20 years. So reading stuff that is much, that is more, you know, foundational is rarely as compelling to me as reading something that's kind of vital and new. That being said, I do consider it a solid recommendation as a follow-up if you want a bit more of the wider story that's going on. Um, but yeah, definitely Spear of the Emperor, number one pick for your first Space Marine novel. Um, and then moving on, uh, the other side of the Imperial military, or one of them, we're not going... We're not going there. Um, <laughs> the other old standby, uh, Gaunt's Ghosts by Dan Abnett. The Gaunt's Ghosts series, I should say, by Dan Abnett. Um, this was my first prose entry into 40K, uh, picking up First and Only, which is the uh, very first novel. It's I should check, but I think it's collected in some collected editions right now. I think it might also be available as a single standalone novel. Um, the over-under on Gaunt's Ghosts is that it's kind of like Sharp's Rifles, but in space. It is set amongst a regiment of the Imperial Guard, or the Astra Militarum, as they're known now, uh, that are just regular human soldiery fighting their way through uh, one crusade of many that is off in a corner of the... Um, Warhammer Universe called the Sabbat Worlds, and it's Saving Private Ryan, but it's Warhammer. It's your basic infantryman trying to get by, fighting, dying, doing their best, and that is compelling as hell. And I think it's also a really good starter series, because you can tell as it goes on, Dan Abnett, the author, another one of the probably top three best you're, you're gonna hear his name again for games in the Workshop. next uh, 20 minutes <laughs> you're gonna hear dan abnett's name over and over um he expands the scope of the series as you read it so it's 16 novels i think and a bunch of short stories and as you go farther through it the characters are shoved into more and more wide-scale conflicts and you get more lore kind of drip fed th to you through the series so if you read it in order you end up kind of gaining the knowledge of the universe along with the characters and it's a super good way to just get a general overview of the imperium yeah it is the imperium through the eyes of the common soldier and all of the horrors that come along with that it also is because it is uh one of the old standbys because it existed it came out so very early in the life of the Black Library, which is Warhammer's uh, Warhammer 40K's kind of like publishing, Games Workshop's publishing arm. In fact, it was the first Black Library novel. Yeah. Thank you very much only. for that. There had been Warhammer novels and Warhammer fiction before this, but published through a different imprint. Uh, Black Library was set up to provide an imprint for any fiction that the company wanted to produce. Um, it's almost kind of like building the universe up around it in a lot of ways. Uh, we're going to get to another series with Dan, Dan's work later on that does the same thing in a different way, but there's a lot of figuring stuff out as it goes along that the Gaunt's Ghost series, especially the early Ghost stuff, um, will develop. Like, we have the Gaunt's Ghost series to thank for uh, the term Vox to replace radio in the Imperium. Uh, Dan Abnett also created Prometheum as essentially, you know, space gasoline. Uh, you just get little things like these that are now so commonplace, but were just invented then because there needed to be a Warhammer version of, you know, whatever it is that needed to be built into the story. So reading the Ghosts novels as they progress is almost kind of like building the Warhammer universe around yourself, which makes it a very easy read because... 
never in those books do you feel like you're missing out on something big because the story is so self-contained that you're not. It almost is the something big because Dan is building the universe that you're reading. So it's impossible to miss it because he invented it. Exactly, exactly. And it also has deeply human characters that, as with any good kind of military sci-fi novel, are a series of archetypes and subversions of archetypes that all bounce off each other in very compelling ways. Um, as a kind of flip side to the ghost novels, another solid recommendation are uh, the exploits of a commissar called Caiaphas Kane, hero of the Imperium, who, if I think you've been in any way adjacent to Warhammer, you will have heard of through memes, if nothing else. Um, where the ghost novels can be quite grim and dark and sometimes upsetting, the Kane novels are the exact opposite. They are extremely lighthearted. They are... If... If the ghosts are Sharp's rifles in space, uh, the Kane novels are Flashman in space. <laughs> Caiaphas Kane is a guy who is, frankly, utterly terrible at his job, but just manages to consistently fail upwards and does so in ways that are just hilarious and deeply entertaining to read. Uh, it offers a nice little counterpoint because, as I think we discussed at the top of the show, while Warhammer is dark and horrible, that dark horror is so over the top that it just lapses around and goes back into humor from the other side and can kind of continue in that cycle. And I feel like that's something that we're definitely, or at least finally starting to see a, reflected a lot more in all, at least more recent um, books to come out of Black Library, where outside of the Caiaphas Cain books for the longest time, like it was a very straight-laced, very serious tone and i know there's a few other books we're going to talk about later but like there have definitely been a lot of really fantastic um books coming out of black library uh, recently that are just hilarious they are so funny they subvert right that grim dark assumption of the universe in such cool ways like the number of times i have just burst out laughing reading a more reading a couple of more recent 40k books is, is is wild like there is a lot of comedy to be found in this setting and it speaks to kane's enduring status as like a figure within the universe that he it, he's canon everything on this list is canon in the sense that it's all part of the continuous the continuity of lore throughout warhammer Kane can exist in this universe just in the same way that Gaunt, who is also a commissar, can exist. Because the setting is that vast and expansive that they're both able to dwell within it. And it, it speaks to his enduring, um, uh, his enduring, I guess, status within it as the fact that there are still Kane novels being developed today. Hell, there's still ghosts, Gaunt's ghost stories being, being developed today. Um, so... Fully check that one out if you want a more lighthearted but still extremely Warhammer route into the the Everyman of the Imperium. And uh, speaking of Everyman, Eisenhorn by Dan Abnett. Uh, beginning with the novel Xenos, leading into the novel Malleus, and finishing up with the novel Hereticus, the Eisenhorn trilogy centers around Gregor Eisenhorn, who is an Imperial Inquisitor. Think of them as the Imperium's secret police, but without anything checking their authority. They are there to protect uh, humanity from the shadows, fighting against agents of anyone who wants to bring the Imperium down. Um, much in the same way that Gaunt's ghosts kind of built a lot of the universe around itself, Eisenhorn did much of the same in a somewhat similar publication time frame. Uh, it was brought out to help Games Workshop uh, with a game called Inquisitor that they were developing, which was, not to digress, but a bit of a radical departure on what they were usually developing in terms of their tabletop stuff, but became a thing unto itself because what Eisenhorn did was build out the civilian side 
of the Imperium. The part of the Imperium that is away from the battlefields and the war-torn hellscapes that make up so much of the setting's prose before that time. Um, it is not the first set of Inquisitor novels. Uh, it would, excuse me, it would be remiss of me not to mention <laughs> Ian Watson's work, but this is a beginner intro to Warhammer, so we will not be talking about Ian Watson. Um, Eisenhorn developed a side of 40k that we never saw until it came out. And Das, I think you just recently read it for the first time. I, I, I literally completed the entire series two days ago. <laughs> and I just finished rereading the entire series probably a week ago. So let's get some of your takes on that. You start us off, Das. Okay. Um, yeah, so it was a really interesting experience for me because I feel like, al along with Gaunt's Ghosts, I, I feel like the Eisenhorn books are probably the most frequent recommendation I hear for people who are new to the setting, which is kind of weird because I've been reading these books and been inculcated in them for years and I just never got around to it. And I finally said, okay, screw it. Like, let's, 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 let's go through these. And they are great, obviously, for all the reasons that Ock mentioned. Like, it really, again, builds out, you know, the sides of the universe that aren't just the big battles. Because I know everyone knows the the tagline for the setting. Like, you know, in the grim darkness of the far future, there's only war. Well, you know, there can't be just war. There needs to be other stuff. Um, and that series does a, such a great job of showing the sheer diversity of other stuff. Uh, the sheer different kinds of planets that exist in the setting all of the various different like lives and societies and factions and all this stuff that's just kind of just going about their daily lives as just minuscule parts of this gigantic universe. And of course, also because that it's also Dan Abnett, you know, it has just the most lovable cast of like roguish characters imaginable. It's like, it really just feels like a collection almost of, almost of comic adventures in a lot of ways. I know Aki and I were talking about this the other day, how, um, given that he has an extensive background in comic writing, uh, and these were some of his earlier novels, like these came back all came back uh, came out all the way back in two thousand and one. Um, it really kind of has the feel of like a collection of comic book adventures um, around this in, this Inquisitor Gregor Eisenhorn and his just kind of merry band of followers. And yeah, like it's the people who it, are it absolutely it absolutely does, and especially because. Dan at the time had been running for 2008, 2000 AD, um, a British comic book where you might know Judge Dredd from. And that sort of pulp detective stuff very much works itself into mm -hmm. Eisenhorn. It's Warhammer crime before Black Library started the Warhammer crime yeah. imprint that they did a few years ago. Yeah. And to those of you who may be somewhat more familiar with kind of the current state of the lore and the setting, there's definitely stuff in there that will feel like a little antiquated and a little dated, but the core is just so rock solid. Again, it's it, you just have this unbelievably likable collection of rogues having adventures in the setting. And yeah, there's, there's, there's just so much to like about it. And it's such a great, like I said, it's such a great entry point because you really... Of all of, because I haven't actually read Gaunt's Ghost, so I'll get there eventually. Don't yell at me. Um, there it is. So just, just save it, save it. Um, at least of all the 40k media I've read, they they probably represent the best examples I've seen of literally. You don't need to know anything. You you could know practically nothing. Maybe read like one or two paragraphs of background text and you will have all you need all you need to follow and really enjoy that story. It, it it's frequently cited as the Xenos, the first novel in the series, is frequently cited as the first novel anyone should read. And I fully understand why. It's a very comfortable intro to a setting that doesn't engage all of the vast swathes of lore you might otherwise feel you need in order just to have a good time with a fun sci-fi novel. And it's especially remarkable that it's such a good entry point to the series because Dan wrote it in six months on a whim after he saw a miniature in the Inquisitor rulebook that he liked the uh, design of. And he went, yeah, I'll write a book. Uh, 
and they told Jesus. him, can you get it out to oh match with the publication of the rule book? And he said, yeah, sure. And cranked out Xenos in about six months. That's bananas. That's, that's, that's bananas. why we love him. That's why, that's why he's the goat. Good lord. <laughs> At a very different end of the spectrum to Eisenhorn, um, and returning to Space Marines, as written by Aaron Dembski bowden we have the Night Lords trilogy. But these aren't the Space Marines of the Imperium. These are Chaos Space Marines. These are Space Marines who have fallen to the worship of the dark gods of Chaos in the Warp. And they are horrible people. And that is what makes these books fun. We mentioned with Spear of the Emperor that Aaron Dembski bowden has an extremely good grasp on human characters even though these are transhuman corrupted demigod figures they are still deeply flawed individuals with characters and wants and needs and desires if anything that are more unlimbered from all of the baggage that the imperium if they were still loyal to it, would place upon them. They also happen to be murderous psychopaths that will just skin you alive and drape your skin on the walls of their chambers as wallpaper. Because or on their clothing or faces yeah, or on their armor or anywhere. Else. They're they're big. They're big skin they're, they're, people. They're big yeah. on the old yeah. fencing. Um, the Night Lords trilogy is super fun because while it has deeply relatable in funny ways characters it is also just a romp in the same way that like how best can i put this james gunn the film director has a wonderful uh i don't want to say formula but let's call it formula uh for the lovable band of assholes storyline that just works it is great to see a bunch of people who absolutely hate each other being strung together in a team because they don't have any other choice. It's why The Suicide Squad was a good movie. It's why Guardians of the Galaxy is so compelling. When you, like, Space Marines are fun characters, but if all, if you have five of them who are all calling each other brother and there's no conflict that exists between them, it can get a little dry. That is never the case in the Night Lords novels. They are constantly bickering they are constantly fighting they are constantly trying to backstab each other or backstab other people often quite literally often extremely literally and that is deeply fun fun describes these novels uh, but it is never at the expense of an extremely almost empathetic plot line if that's a good way of describing it, it. It really makes you feel for these psychopathic murderers exactly and you will be sad if they die and they go through Any it. Any of them. They go through it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how Bound does this every single time. Yeah. Every single time. He can make you he can make you root for objectively wretched individuals. Like it's someone that you would not want anywhere near any aspect of your life. You will be rooting for them to succeed. And that's You wouldn't even want to be on sad your when planet. they die. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that is just that's just a phenomenal experience to read in general. And I've seen the Night Lords trilogy pop up again and again. It's a, it's an extremely good read. And at the same time, I feel a very good introduction to that specific side of the lore. Because throughout it, these characters will encounter big heavy players in the 40k universe and explore lore concepts that will have you asking more questions. But it is also never at the expense of the plot and never at the expense of a good time. And that is a, that's a fine line to walk, and these books do it with absolute aplomb. And this is another one where ADB has those really human-level characters that don't understand the setting, and so you can get the kind of, like in, a mo like in movies where you have a character explaining things to the guy who doesn't know anything, you've got that going on, but not in a didactic or annoying way. Just yeah. in the way of like, oh, I was wondering that too. Cool. Yeah, it's, it's an extremely fun part of the Warhammer universe that so many of the, especially the human characters, are so deeply ignorant of everything that goes on within the world that they live in that you open up very fun narrative possibilities for how they're going to discover that alongside the audience that's discovering it with them. Which also 
you know, relates them to the audience themselves. It's actually very handy. Bowden's so good. I don't know. He just has superpowers, I swear. Uh, we are going to return one final time on this list to Dan Abnett with a kind of curious little book that he did called Titanicus. The book involves the Titan legions. These are building-sized war machines uh, that are essentially some of the most powerful weapon systems in the 40k universe. And as with everything in 40k, there is a whole culture that is developed around them. What Titanicus does is offer blockbuster action. And I do mean this in a very literal sense that the action sequences in this book are better than most Hollywood movies I have watched. They are extremely fun. While also at the same time, in a very Dan Abnett sort of way, fleshing out a side of the Warhammer universe that hasn't really been that explored. In this case, the Adeptus Mechanicus of Mars. The tech priests, the religion that forms a second empire within and alongside the Imperium that governs all of its technology. The Mechanicus had not really been super explored in fiction by the time that Titanicus dropped, and Titanicus gave us a whole lot of new stuff to chew on. And if reading this book for the first time, you are finding out a whole bunch of new things, congratulations, because when I read it for the first time, that was my experience too. And it is happening amidst these, as I said, blockbustery action sequences that are just, just extremely entertaining to read. I think that's one of the things that you're going to get a lot with any of these books on our list so far, is that as much as we talk about the human characters and the lore, at the end of the day, these are books about people fighting. And yeah, no matter they're war what, stories. they're all going to be entertaining, exciting, action-packed. You'll have descriptions of violence that you couldn't have comprehended of. And I, I mean that in the best possible way. I second Especially that. if you read the Night Lords books. Especially if you read yeah. the Night Lords books. <laughs> The, the horror element and the, the, the gore and the graphic parts of this should not be understated. I suppose that that is actually kind of, Sal, you're kind of checking us on our... This is a bit of a cherub moment where we're so inured to the violence that takes place in these books that... Um, yeah, no, seriously. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go back into this podcast and edit in a bit of a, a, a content warning. <laughs> To be like, I know you're here for Warhammer, but uh, before you engage in any of the bo these books, please be aware that they are extremely graphic. <laughs> yeah, there's going to yeah. be flensing, eyes are going to be popping out, skulls are going to be crushed. It's all part of the fun. Yeah, it's like it's like oh, your yeah. favorite 80s uh, schlock horror movie. Yeah, e uh, yeah, picture Evil Dead 2 in space. There we go. But yeah, Titanicus, Titanicus will flesh out a side of the Warhammer universe that is not well explored in other novels it's very rarely touched upon we're starting to get some more but it's a just a rip-roaring good time <laughs> moving on to something more quieter developing upon eisenhorn the vaults of terror series this series has entered into one of my all-time favorite statuses in warhammer prose Likewise. Um, definitely it is by chris race it is an Inquisitor-based novel, similar to Eisenhorn, but it is based on Terra itself, formerly Earth, the homeworld of humanity. One of the few times in Warhammer fiction we end up getting prose that is actually set on the throne world itself, and even deals with concepts surrounding the Emperor and the Imperial Palace. This series is one that will take you on quite a deep walkthrough of lore. This is one that will have you asking a lot of questions. This is one that will have you probably referencing wikis a whole lot, leading to potential wiki deep dives. But that lore never overwhelms the story itself. And that is a delicate line to walk. And I think Chris Wright does it with absolute aplomb. I think at least the way I usually describe that series, it's like, it's essentially like 40k meets Blade Runner in a lot of ways. Like, there are major elements of noir. Like, you could tell that, like, Chris Reed is trying to essentially do kind of film noir-esque stuff in 40K. Especially, like, if, if anyone in here has ever watched, like, old noir, neo-noir. You know, like, the, the city it's set in is almost a character. 
in addition to being the setting. And that's what that's what Chris Rake makes Terra and like the Imperial Palace feel like. Like he he turns this hellscape of a planet into a character. And oh my god, it's so cool. Yeah. It's it's easily one of the most atmospheric 40 series of 40k books um I've ever encountered. It's it's just awesome. Chris Wright tickles my lore brain like almost no other author currently working for Games Workshop does. I will yeah. I will bad for him till the cows come home because he will just work in paragraphs that are lore dumps essentially that form world building that are still relevant to the plot. And I Are you thinking love, about the vellum? I'm thinking about the vellum. He's thinking about the vellum, of course he's thinking it's about the vellum. All time S tier Warhammer lore prose sequence. And if you read these books, you'll know what I mean. There is there are a few people working with Black Library right now that can kind of quite do what Chris does. And the Vaults of Terra are to my mind some of his finest works. You will leave this series with a lot of questions. But those questions will take you to other parts of the Warhammer universe, and you will thank us for it. Not, I think, a typical recommendation for beginners, but a compelling one, in my opinion. Especially if you're the kind of person to go on wiki deep dives. This it's, is yes, yeah, a yeah. gold mine. A lot of intro lists can kind of focus on ones that are very, like, user-friendly to an extent. The ones that can appeal the broadest, which, of course, they absolutely should. But... Some of us out there just really like getting into the nitty gritty of things, really like immediately delving and hyper fixating potentially on a new source of fictional intake. And my God, the Vaults of Terror will give you that. Although I would say kind of as a quick point or addendum, not just about Vaults of Terror, really about all of these books. Um, on the one hand, never be afraid of like, to just like go look something up you're like okay i don't know what this person's necessarily talking about you can always just go look it up somewhere that said beware of unintentionally spoiling yourself because wiki pages especially that may have compiled say all the information about a single character might in the first two paragraphs inadvertently drop you know a spoiler about a particular book or particular character's fate etc so by all means like as, as you're going through books and you're like i Okay, I'm I'm lost. Like, what's this thing again? Use those resources. Just know that depending on where you go, you may be setting yourself up for spoilers. Absolutely seconded. I, I've often described modern comic books as, or sp like sp specifically X Men comic books, as being written with the uh, access to the information at hand. Like, you don't. No longer do authors feel like they have to explain who a character is when they show up because they assume that if you're confused, you'll whip out your phone and you'll look it up. To an extent that happens with this, but as Daz says, proceed with caution. Where you should not proceed with caution to, however, is reading the first um, alien perspective, sort of, novel on this list. Slick transition. Thank you, thank you. Got we gotta, we gotta nail those segues. Boom. This is Gasgol, Prophet of the Wa, by Nate. Yes. Kravitz. Yes. It is something of a trope amongst Warhammer fan discussions that the Xenos, the alien characters of the setting, are often a bit underserved in the novels. That is, to an extent, true. There are way more novels about the Imperium than there are about the alien factions in the setting, but. Oh, there are some doozies amongst those novels. And Gazgol is one of my all-time favorites. Uh, it focuses on the most famous orc character in the setting, Gazgol Thraka, and his rise to power. And it is a wonderful exploration of the orcs, what they do as a species, who they are as a faction, what drives them, and how much fun they can be while that is happening this book is so freaking funny it's so funny without without like without making a joke of itself like it's still an amazing story about the orcs about this character but man it's hilarious it is it is genuinely funny and nate is nate is an author who i find deeply compelling for his ability to take extremely silly things seriously while also not losing sight of what makes him funny and 
walking that fine line between treating it with the respect that it deserves and also having fun with it. There's something that I will often like wax upon is how irony is such a stock in trade of a lot of modern popular fiction. Nothing Nate does, and in a lot of ways that Warhammer in general doesn't do, is that it doesn't like, it doesn't look at the camera and kind of be like, isn't this ridiculous? I roll, but we're both in on the joke. It just lets you engage with it completely straight faced. And because the setting is both extremely grim and extremely funny, it's able to do that. And this novel is a good epitome of that. Um, something I also like about it is that um, if you're familiar with the term flanderization, it is when a character or faction or concept gets repeated and used so much that it kind of becomes a parody of itself. Um, orcs often suffer from this in fan discourse. Uh, there's a couple of concepts about their species that get memes to the point that opinions and beliefs about them develop that kind of aren't true. This book will dispel every meme idea that you have picked up about orcs and clarify them for you. It is probably the best fictional primer you can get for the orcs outside of their codex. Yeah, definitely. And this is also one probably more so than any of the books here. I know um, Sal and I already mentioned that the almost all of these audiobooks are exceptionally well done. The audiobook for Gaskell is so good. <laughs> they have multiple narrators narrating different characters, and each one of them, they did not have to go as hard as they did, but I'm so glad that they did. And the yeah, the, the audiobook for Gaskell is just, just it's incredible. <laughs> it's so I'll cool. second that because the book also has essentially imperial characters to provide the human point of view to it. So threads the uh, threads the line between perspective and narrator that uh, can conflict sometimes with the alien focus novels. And speaking of alien focus novels, another by the wonderful Nate Crowley, the twice dead King Ruin is a seminal work on the Necrons species, which are to give the crude one sentence pitch, uh, ancient Egyptian space robots. Zombie space robots. Zombie space robots. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the Necrons have been around in 40k lore since the oof, 90s, but were fully fleshed out in the early 2000s and then significantly rebooted a couple of editions later. For the better. For the better. Definitely for the better. For the better. Hot take. You can fight me in the comments for that one, but it is definitely better than it was in third. <laughs> But The Twice Dead King centers around an exile prince of a particular Necron dynasty and his trials and tribulations as he attempts to save that particular dynasty. It's a really great exploration of the Necrons themselves, how their society functions, or rather doesn't. And within that dysfunction, there is just some extremely fun times to be had. This is... I have not read Gaskell. Now I have to go read that. Uh, my Audible credit just rolled in, so I guess that's what I'm getting. Hell yeah. But Twice Dead King is hilarious and deeply melancholic simultaneously. Yep. And it's just wonderful. The characters are unique and types of characters that you really can't see in anything else, really. I can't think of any other books that I've read that deal with a similar cast of characters, whether Warhammer or not. And seeing the way that their unique, like, existence interacts with the world around them leads to some of the funniest and saddest moments I've gotten to in any Warhammer novel. The Necrons as a concept are melancholy. They are an empire that is so far past its prime it's hilarious but they're still trying to make it work and there's just a sadness to their existence that is at the same time funny but as sal says deeply melancholy and i don't know that just it just makes for some deeply compelling characters to engage with and also shout out to nate for being one of the um 
one of the Warhammer authors who manages to finally work in gender and trans representation to factions within this universe, something that the other novels do somewhat lack, uh, we see in his prose. And I... And he does it remarkably naturally. Yep. Like, it's, it's incredibly well done. Yep. But to round off the alien side of things... Uh, and this one can be considered a uh, quite an advanced level, if adva- beginner advanced, shall we say, and probably the most atypical choice on this list compared to other lists. We love we love a hot take. Firecast by Peter Fehervari is a novel that deals with the Imperial Guard, the Astra Militarum, fighting the Tau Empire on a deeply screwed up planet. Peter Fehervari's work forms a bit of a curious part of the 40k dynamic, the 40k continuum, in to an, to a similar way that Dan Abnett's does. Like people will often talk about how the Abnett verse is its own little corner of Warhammer. Peter Fehervari, Peter Fehervari, excuse me, and his uh, Dark Coil, as his interrelated novels have become known, are very much their own thing. They are still canon. They still exist within the continuity of Warhammer lore, but they are highly idiosyncratic, unlike any of the other authors on this list in terms of how indirect they are, and phenomenally weird. Faravari is someone, I believe, who understands very, very well that the Warhammer universe is a fundamentally broken existence. Nothing works nothing should work, everyone is crazy, everything is horrible, you're going to suffer, isn't that fun? His books are just deeply weird in the way that Warhammer me- needs more of. Exactly. Fire- I still haven't read it. Uh, it, it. it. An audio version of it is going to be dropping, I think, a week or two after this podcast will go out. So check it out by that. I think it's getting a print rerun as well. So hooray for that. This is a novel that you're going to want to get to if you are interested in exploring a side of Warhammer that's very weird, but also fleshes out the Tau in ways that we haven't really seen in other novels. Um, They have gotten a good few appearances. A few of their characters, Commander Farsight, for example, have gotten series uh, written for them. This one is, to my mind, their most fun and Ex, like explorative read um while at the same time uh centering some imperial characters as well and offering an insight into just how screwed up this universe is um you have a bunch of people fighting on a horrible plague-ridden jungle world and none of them really know why they're there anymore but the war continues And if that kind of isn't Warhammer personified, I really don't know what is. It's going to be a very different experience for you. I think even like experienced Warhammer lore people may not have dipped into Peter Fehervari's work. I highly encourage you to do so because it is unlike any other black library fiction out there. Cannot recommend it enough. Yeah, I'm going to have to get to that. You are. You are. You absolutely are. I know. I know. You've been yelling at me to... To get into his work for so long and i i know I'm, I'm getting there i promise all of these books i will put lists of and links to in the description here because i want to make it as easy as possible for anyone to follow what they're interested in i think to kind of round off this discussion i want to underscore that everyone's experience of warhammer is going to be their own Everyone is going to find aspects of the setting that they find cool or fun. Um, Often when people ask me, I really want to start an army. I really want to start, you know, the hobby side of things. Who should I play? I will simply just tell them, like, find who you think looks coolest and go with that. Because whatever about the gaming side, we're not going to go into that. You are engaging with something that is fun. You are here to have a good time. You're here to explore a fictional universe that you find interesting and fascinating. And it is there for you to explore in precisely the way you want to explore it. We are not here to gatekeep. We are here to 
open the gates and, open the gates. and welcome you in with open arms to come and join us exactly just join us join us in this fun because ultimately that is what this is it is just so much fun although one one last quick point i know we, we talked a little bit about this about but book recommendations the more lore savvy and setting savvy folks may be asking at their screens or headphones but but oculus what about the horus heresy books oh yes I was supposed to get to that at the top of the show, but I was too eager to talk about the fun stuff. Uh, the Horus Heresy is one of the most famous series in Warhammer Prose. It is, I think at its base, 54 books long. And then it's so when books. you attach the Siege of Terra on top of that, it becomes 64 books long. I have read all of them <laughs> somehow. <laughs> Jesus I was there from the beginning. I was there at the second print run of the I very first you. book. I know. I, I, poor I, bastard. I am worthy of your pity. Give me. I am sustained yeah, by your pity. <laughs> the Horus Heresy is not for beginners. The Horus Heresy is a terrible, terrible place to begin exploring Warhammer. This is a hot Agreed. take, but I don't really think it's a hot take. Some of the most compelling things to me about reading Horus Rising, the first book in the series, back when it dropped, was I'm seeing a completely different version of the Imperium to the Imperium that I'm used to, to the Imperium that I, at that point, had been exploring for quite some time and had gone to know. And now I'm seeing all of those tenants of the Imperium completely subverted and flipped on their heads and turned around. And that was the joy of it. That was part of the joy of it, especially knowing that all of this is going to come crashing down. Spoilers. Spoilers. Spoil. <laughs> that is not a place to begin. No. I, the Horus Heresy is too complicated in general. It is too involved. It is too predicated upon a deep understanding, or at least a, a, a journeyman's understanding of what the Imperium is for you to enjoy it. Yeah. It's like if someone asked how to start learning about Greek mythology and you told them to go read, like, the Alexander Pope Iliad. Yeah. It, it's it, just not yeah. a good starting point. Or, hi, I want to read, I want to read, uh, the, I want to love the Lord of the Rings. Where do I go? Oh, you read the Silmarillion. Yeah, like, don't do that. You want to, you want to, for some reason, finish Game of Thrones all the way to the end. Okay, start at House of the Dragon first. Like, it's not going to... It's not going to hit the same hit. way. Yeah. It's not going to hit yeah. the same way. We will yeah. almost certainly gather together to do another uh, several episodes on the Horus Heresy series because there's utterly no way we cover 64 books in one yeah. hour and a half. And the sheer volume of deranged takes on that book series that the three of us have. And if in a library of its own. There's a lot of a Yeah. 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 We, we've got thoughts. The thought today is that don't do it. If you are a beginner, if you're starting out, if you're trying to get yourself grounded in the setting, don't do the Horus Heresy. That's not where you start. That's where you arrive to, in my opinion. Again, this is me. I'm not here to gatekeep. If you are really wanting to start with it, by all means, feel free. It is, however, the opinion of the author and his co-authors that uh, not the best place to do it from. Definitely. And thank you, Daz, for reminding me to talk about the thing that I was I going you, to buddy. talk about. Um, I got you. I mean, we placed a ban on me mentioning it for several <laughs> reasons. So that's that. That's for the, the the welfare of the listeners. I like the, the way welfare you, you, of the listeners. You also self enforced your ban on talking about the Badab War. So. It's true. Kudos uh, to you for don't, that. Kudos don't get you me started. We'll have episodes on that later or else. Yeah. Phenomenal restraint on your part. As we said before recording, uh, Sal has invented new slurs to refer to, <laughs> uh, to characterize his takes on uh, several of these topics. They're brand new, never before heard. Exclusive, exclusive content here <laughs> on, uh, on oculusimperia.youtube.ca. <laughs> <laughs> that has been a beginner's guide to Warhammer lore through the Black Library. There will be a more SEO-friendly title to this video. I want to thank everyone for joining us, if you've lasted this long. It's been really fun to be able to talk about something a little bit more off the cuff 
and from a non-diegetic perspective for once. Um, ultimately, as I said, we want anyone who is curious about Warhammer to have a route into it. I hope that the books recommended here today will provide that for you. I hope that if you have any other ideas about things that we may have missed, that you'll pop them down in the comments or you'll just sound off about them to your friends because ultimately this is a social thing. We're all in this together and we're all having fun together and we're all talking about how much fun we have with it together. That's what makes this universe so cool. That's why I can sit here amongst my paints and my books and talk to people who have only read the books and talk to people who've come up through an entirely different game system to the <laughs> one that I did. And that's why we love it. So thank you for being here with us. And until such a time as another podcast happens, I'm not going to do my channel send off. I am going to say thank you very much to Das and thank you very much to Sal for joining me here today. Pleasure being here, buddy. Thanks for having us. So uh, until a time as we talk again, have a good one. Got him. <laughs> See ya. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash Oculus Imperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.